predators who are straight who are coming onto the web to the website to meet these women. She said that the aim is to make you kill yourself. That what has uh, in terms of the support or the reaction from your the country of your birth being like? I got into trouble for was when I joined uh, the, the lesbian dating app, Her. How can you pause activism that's preventing children from being mutilated? Does it have to be such a mental health catastrophe for everybody on, on all sides that's getting involved in it? You know? I would argue it's not a mental health catastrophe for, the, for those on the other side. The other side are having perfectly normal careers. Yes. One of the, his fellow doctors described homosexuality as a disease. When both of them know that it's destroyed my career, you know, destroyed my, my ability to make a living. Both of them know this. The following conversation is with writer, producer, and broadcaster, Graeme Linnan. Graeme is known to many as the co-creator of Father Ted, the IT crowd, and Black Books, and also more recently for his views and participation in the transgender debate. I reached out to Graeme in an effort to understand his views, to find out why the debate is so contentious and why so many people on both sides feel so threatened and so scarred by the mere act of debating the issues. I believe in free speech, but more importantly, the freedom to challenge and interrogate ideas, no matter how unsettling. Graham has also released a fascinating new book called Tough Crowd. And in the book, he documents his rise through the comedy ranks in the UK. It's packed full of hints and tips and strategies and ideas for any budding writer or producer or director or film school graduate to help them along their way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Graeme Linnan, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Connor. Lovely to be here. Um, in closing, tough crowd, you mentioned that you were finally beginning to relax. How are you now at the start of 2024? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? How are you feeling? Well, unfortunately, I've, I'm still being sued by a particularly virulent trans rights activist. So that's kind of hanging over me now, which is kind of the point. All these people do is is try and, uh, as we say in, in this fight, uh, the, the process is the punishment, you know? So the case is nonsense and it will, I, I can't imagine it will go much further, but the, the point is to make me worry about it. And the point is to make me suffer, suffer. So, uh, so I'm doing my best to try and kind of put it to one side and, and, and concentrate on the positives of which there are a few. Um, I've finally got an actual script writing job coming up, uh, or at least a, a discussion about one. Um, but it's, uh, they're, they're, they're showing a lot of commitment in a really good way. Um, uh, I can't even tell you because it might be scuppered if anyone found out what it was. Uh, but and you know the book is doing is doing pretty well for a hardback. Uh, yeah, it's it's going okay, not going too bad. In terms of um, the the litigation process, this is part of the process of demoralization. Yes, yes, and just trying to make it as uh, unpleasant as possible for anyone who enters into this fight. You know, the the. The the kind of uh, assumption is that I don't know. I mean, they must really. I I guess they must really believe their own propaganda about us, you know. And they think that the courts are going to go their way, but they never do. And what's always strange about this, and I noticed this with um, the cases of Alison Bailey with Garden Court Chambers and Maya Forstadter with her old employers, is they go to the wire every time. They seem to think. The law is on their side, possibly because Stonewall has told them that it is, but it's not. It doesn't start, you know, it's perfectly legitimate to uh, say that women need single sex spaces, that children shouldn't be placed on hormones and, and puberty blockers and, and have, have irreversible surgeries. These are all legitimate points of view, but uh, but they they come from a basis that these points of view are illegitimate. 
and therefore anything they do to uh, fight them is is noble, I guess. Why why you do you think, Graham? Uh, there are many people involved in this discussion on both sides, but you seem to attract um, a huge amount of antipathy from the uh, from the uh, other side. I think there's a number of reasons. The first, like, like uh, you know, I, she's never been particularly supportive, but uh, I've very, I think my story is very close to J.K. Rowling's in everything except being a billionaire. Um, you know, basically, I was kind of impeccably left wing. Uh, I still consider myself on the left, uh, although certainly not this latest incarnation of the left. Um, but uh, and I was and I and the other thing I did was I created something that was very loved by the kind the the generation that's now uh, uh, that now thinks I'm I'm a monster, uh, and that was the IT crowd. And I think I've, as a critic, I I kind of, kind of know this impulse. You know, I remember I saw the film Holy Motors by Leo Carax. Leo Carax was very very important to me, uh, as a as a when I was eighteen years old. He made uh, Les Amants du Pont Neuf and Mauvais Sang, two of my favorite. Les Amants du Pont Neuf, the French, the French, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And the bridges, Mauvais, yeah. and Mauvais Sang. Uh, two films that, that really changed my life, you know, very pretentious looking back at them. But, mm. but at the time, they just, they, they, I still think they're incredible films. Brilliant. Um, films. Yeah. And then he brought out Holy Motors, which I really didn't like. And I remember at the time acting almost as if it was a personal slight, the film. I did a series of tweets about it, just disgusted with it. I was so annoyed. I found it uh, frivolous and, uh, and, and not worthy of him. And I went in very hard. And I think that that kind of betrayal, uh, that sense of betrayal is something that people perhaps feel about me. Mm. Why, why aren't you playing along? Why aren't you being, uh, why aren't you, I like your shows, so why aren't you agreeing with me on this? And I think then that the, the response to that is even more, uh, you know, uh, violent. Uh, so yeah, so I think it's it's almost unfortunately it's almost a a consequence of my making shows that people like. Well, uh, um, plus the the scale of your Twitter following. At one point, you had nine hundred thousand, right? Which is yeah. an enormous audience and community uh, of influence. Yes. Um, um. So back in two thousand and eighteen, you're lying on a gurney, and you chose this moment as the one to, was it to like a tweet, remind me, or to, to send out a tweet by J.K. Rowling that precipitated? No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't about Rowling. It was right. basic. It was, there was a, there's a woman, wonderful woman called Heather Brunskill Evans, and she wrote a piece. Um, and, you know, I, this happened to me a lot in the early stages, <laughs> you know, like I read the piece and I thought, oh my God, that's incredibly compassionate, very well argued, shows the different, uh, uh, forces at play mm. doesn't doesn't throw women under the bus and and has compa and shows uh, empathy towards what uh, transsexuals are going through. Um, so yeah, I'll share it. And that was the moment I just thought, you know, okay, this is this. There's nothing wrong with this, you know. So I did, and it was instant. Just instantly uh, started getting swarms of people uh, sending abuse. Um, and I realize I I only realized later that for for trans rights activists it's it's a binary thing, <laughs> uh, ironically enough. Uh, basically, you're with us or you're against against us. Any step outside this this very narrow delineation that they have created is seen as as uh, uh, you know uh, you're on the you're on the other side. You're 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 the enemy. So, you know, I, and then I thought, well, no, you know, of course, people must have misread it. I'll share something else that shows that this is a, a, a debate we should be having. And it's very important. And there's aspects of various things going on. I mean, I didn't realize immediately what was happening. It took me a while to realize, for instance, that, you know, um, a, there, there'd been a lot of previous to my getting into the debate. There'd been a lot of kind of grooming going on, going on between kids like they are literally kind of telling each other uh what to say uh like for the most famous the most famous example of this is kids in in trans support groups telling each other how to lie to doctors 
to get their hands on hormones. You know, that's a that's a, a an established uh, route to hormones. Um, so I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that there was a kind of network of people who had kind of um, who had created a narrative uh, that that they uh, that 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 was kind of um, internalized to such an extent that they didn't even have to think about it anymore. Whereas to everybody else, it's, it comes out of nowhere. Like for instance, my favorite was when Stephen Fry, who's been very ignorant on this and and does not see what's going on, refuses to uh, see what's going on. Um, but he 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 expressed um, he he expressed his surprise that the Wachowski brothers of the Matrix were voted the some of the in the top ten of great women directors, right? And it was like he said, but they weren't women when when they made it. And he got sworn to reply saying they were always women <laughs> because that's the that's the line. You know, they were always women. They just had the wrong bodies for a while and then they got it fixed, mm. you know. So these these kind of um, bizarre beliefs were already pretty set. And I didn't quite realize because I hadn't been monitoring my own side of Twitter. I had been monitoring the right wing. I was obsessed with the right. I thought the right wing were having a huge moment and were about to take over the world with Trump and Brexit and so on. And I now realized that <clears throat> even though I, I wasn't aware of what was going on on the left, uh, uh, to the extent that it was going on, I was being influenced by the left in terms of the catastrophic thinking, uh, the, hy uh, the hyperbolic language, all these things were kind of guiding the way I was thinking about things. So um, yeah, it was a surprise. It was a it was a complete shock. It came out of nowhere, um, and it's it's been continuing now for six years, something like six or seven years. I think I think it's six years, six years. So um, yeah. And to, to clarify your position, you have never disputed um, gender dysphoria as a condition, as a medical condition, or have you no i know there's some conversation i mean at the moment now the conversation is so developed and women are so angry that i do believe that gender dysphoria as a condition is being questioned uh, i think some people don't believe it exists i would call it body dysphoria or body dysmorphia um and i do think that some people have it. however uh <laughs> well actually this is a funny story it kind of goes back to when me and Arthur were writing um father ted we both lived in the same house and one day we turned on Horizon and it was a documentary about uh, people who believed that their limbs, uh, th that there there was, they just wanted, basically they wanted to get a limb put off. They felt that their leg or their arm was an alien part of themselves and they wouldn't be happy unless it was, it, unless it was cut off. And Horizon documented, I think the first and only time that doctors said, okay, we'll do this. We'll do this and we will um, see if it makes you feel better. And they did. And I remember like there was a really grim, me and Arthur and I, you know, days before the, inter the internet, this was our internet, these kind of weird programs, you know. Yeah. And uh, and after the, the operation, one of the guys said, and this is what made us laugh, even though it's terribly dark. He said, that was a terrible mistake. <laughs> You know, he he got no. He, he begged doctors to cut off his leg, and they had. And then he's like, "Oh no, I shouldn't have done that." Uh, now the person who wrote, who made that documentary was a guy called Malcolm Clark, who's now in the LGB Alliance, and he points out that this idea that you will cure a mental illness by cutting off parts of your body has disappeared since that Horizon documentary, except in this area except in the area of pediatric medicine. And shockingly, it's actually caught fire. It's it's now considered best practice by a lot of, uh, luckily it's being reversed in a lot of European countries and America is, is, uh, is having some interesting discussions as well. But for a long time, the idea that putting off a piece of yourself uh, would cure your mental problems was fashionable. And uh, that's what I object to, uh, specifically 
uh, the idea, and also I object to what I believe is installing these body disassociative ideas into children's heads by telling them there's more than three sex, two sexes. <laughs> now I'm doing it. Telling them there's more than two sexes, telling them that they may have been born in the wrong body, telling them that ger gender nonconformity is a sign that you've been born in the wrong body. Um, I find, I think it's all evil. I think it's pure evil. And I think that look, we will look back on it where uh, a whole generation of gay and gender non-conforming youth were irrevocably harmed by unnecessary procedures. One of the things when you were recounting that story that, I, uh, that is really shocking to me is, is the idea that a patient can convince a doctor through the process of speaking to perform a surgery. It goes against everything, you, our understanding of medical science and... The, Do no harm. Yeah, well. first do no harm. I mean, it's the it's the most basic mantra um, yeah. in 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 the medical profession. Um, and we have one of the one of the worst uh, examples of this is is an Irish uh, woman named uh, Shiv uh, Gallagher, I think her name is. Gallagher is famous for um, doing TikTok videos where she kind of dances while talking about yeeting the teats. In other words, she is a production line going where she's taking the breasts off young girls and she's and, and, and she's putting the videos up on TikTok. So so, you know, this is a and, and I also think it's no coincidence that this uh, that this uh, movement has started in places like L.A., places like, you know, East Coast, uh, West Coast uh, uh, American cities uh where plastic surgery is considered a i don't know just a normal form of um of healthcare you know and uh where 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 healthcare isn't free as well i think that's another thing interesting thing that's going on so basically there's been a gold rush and like a friend of mine is a trans man uh Scott Nugent and Scott god Scott's arm i don't i don't know whether you've seen these operations but they remove a, a, a section of arm that they use to make a rolled up version of a penis, you know? It's like something from a science fiction film. The, the, the idea that anyone would think it has anything to do with healthcare. And now he sh Scott shows his, his arm and the, the, the veins or the, 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 the nerves are so close to the surface. It just looks, and he says it hurts all the time. And he, you know, he, he thinks his surgeon was an absolute butcher. You know, and he's he's he he fully passes. Sorry, he fully passes as a man. You know, he absolutely passes, but he is in despair because of what has been done to him. And he's 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 I say he it's a, it is a she, and I hope Scott wouldn't mind me, um, uh, you know, correctly sexing sexing, but um, but uh, he's in despair at the idea that what he's experienced and what he's been put through is going to happen to more young people you know there's all these facts that i have at my fingertips now because of this fight you know another one of them is that these young girls who are on testosterone who you see in videos they're obviously around 21 22 uh they have they have had top surgery uh they sometimes have facial hair so they're on testosterone those girls who are on testosterone they'll go into the menopause 20 years too early and the menopause is no joke you know, the menopause, you know, other things associated with it are dementia, uh, um, uh, being un unable to sleep. Osteoporosis, I think, as well, isn't it? Osteoporosis, I think, happens when you come off testosterone. So okay. so that's an even, you know, but that's no good reason to stay on testosterone. You know what I mean? The, the whole thing is don't give kids testosterone at all, you know. Um, so, you know, all these things are... are um, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, all these things are kind of uh, uh, adding up to a, a huge crisis in healthcare, and it's not going to end. It's gonna it's gonna continue on. I mean, like you know, I gave the example on a podcast the other day. I hope you don't mind me repeating myself. But in Canada, I know this trans woman, uh, a trans identified man, who uh, had the operation, uh, inverted inverted penis, whatever however it's done 
and uh, regrets it and is now take, making use of Canada's assisted, assisted dying program. So you've got like a, a medical system that destroys people and then kills them, <laughs> you know, destroys their health and then kills them. So I don't know. It's like we sleepwalked into a kind of a, a hellscape, you know, and um, as I often say, I can't, I can't get anyone to care. I can't get anyone to care about it. Is it that people don't care, do you think, or are there, are there people who are afraid to voice their concern? Um, it is in the silence. It is easier to live in this with silence, um, harbor your own fears and concerns. It's not at your door. Do you think that's part of part of it? I'd say the comparison I sometimes reach for is the people who lived in the village next to Daha. You know, it's like you know. I think that, I think when soldiers liberated that head, they took those villagers and made them walk through the grounds. You know, now this is obviously not on the level of the Holocaust, but when I show photographs of these young kids who have been mutilated, uh, it's not to shock them. It's just to make it's just to try and galvanize people to try and make them go, oh yeah, actually this is wrong. We must do something about it. But year upon year passes, as I say, it's now six years, and I can't get anyone to comment on it. it. It really would only take a couple of people, you know? It would just take a few people to say, hang on a second, you know, this is obviously an important conversation. We have to make sure that everyone is safe to have the conversation without, without having, for instance, their, their lives destroyed or their careers destroyed. But, but it, that's beyond... Even you can't even get people to acknowledge that it's happening, you know, like I, I, I often like turn on a TV and see someone who I've worked with in the past, most recently Armando Yanucci, before him, Graham Norton, sort of hand waving the, away the idea that woke uh, wokeism is a problem when both of them know that it's destroyed my career, you know, destroyed my, my ability to make a living. Both of them know this. And 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 the. the like, I, I just find it extraordinary, extraordinary that they cannot make the connection to what I'm talking about and that it doesn't give them some feeling of, I don't know, I've, I've thought about this so much. It's 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 I, I think it's clear what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. The, the argument that the medical profession in the doctors in Canada might make is that that, that vulnerable patient who made those life changing alterations may have without those alterations, may have taken the ultimate step in ending things prematurely, right? Yeah. That would be their argument. Sure. But that's, uh, that's like, that's like, uh, you know, that's like, that's like someone having a sore thumb and cutting their arm off, you know? This is not going to help them. You're not going to help distress people by doing this. To them. Look, I'll give you another, here's, here's an interesting fact. They found that uh, transsexuals with dementia who wake up in nursing homes in, in old age are incredibly distressed because they do not know what's happened to their bodies. You know, mm. so so the idea that this is an innate and natural thing that people it's it it's not it's it's artificial it's it's corporate it's man made it's faddish you know. I remember, I think it was, there was a, a therapist friend of mine, I can't remember who said it exactly, it may have been Stella O'Malley, but someone someone said it to me. Um, uh, they said that um, they had a friend, no, it wouldn't have been Stella, she wouldn't have given it this away, sorry, it may have just been uh, uh, just uh, someone, a feminist, but, um, but she said that she had a friend who was like listening to the arguments and worried about it and concerned and and uh, and her her daughter was going through something, uh, going through something like this, saying they were trans or non-binary or whatever. And uh, they're having a productive conversation until one day the woman came in and just when they started talking about it, she just said, I love my trans son. And, and they tried to engage her a little bit more. And all she would say was, I love my trans son. And so, I don't know, I'm putting two and two together I think that there was a crisis, there was a threat, and this person just realized that to save, to keep, to keep their child on side, to keep them within, you know, to keep them within 
at least some hope of keeping them safe, she had to uh, bow to the religion, bow to the new kind of uh, uh, language and the new reality. But the reality is the same as it's always been, you know. You don't cure people by by destroying their, their puberty by by you know mutilating. You you just you just don't do it. How significant was the closing of the Tavistock Clinic? Well, it, it, it's really interesting because apparently what's happening now is that the whistleblowers who originally raised concerns are now working alongside some of the people who were uh, who were uh, who were responsible for the corruption of the Tavistock Clinic. So the people who who believe in early affirmation. Uh, one one therapist told me that he, he, he worked at the Tavistock. Told me that um, he told me that one of the his fellow doctors described homosexuality as a disease. You know, uh, so the the these people are still working in this uh, in this uh, clinic with vulnerable children. Luckily, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot, sorry, not in the clinic, but like these people are being, uh, sorry, these are the satellite clinics that are being proposed and that are being set up. Um, that's where they're working alongside them. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, so there's still a problem in that the ethos is really persistent. It's like a weed and it's hard to get out of these. Uh, once people have been absolutely convinced that they're on the right track, it's hard to disabuse them of that because once they realize what they've done to these kids, I mean, God, I, I don't think I'd be able to live with the psychological fallout of that, you know. So they are incredibly defensive. Uh, it's just lingering in all these different places like the BBC. Some parts of the BBC website are still linking to mermaids, even though mermaids is under investigation. Um, it's just a really pernicious and, and kind of weed like uh, um, uh, philosophy. Uh, so. It is great that it, that the Tavistock has been closed, but it, you know there's still a lot of work to do to get rid of the philosophy. It's very difficult to um, to change a philosophy, isn't it? Um, you can take practical steps and take practical measures, but a philosophy and ideology, as we we have seen recently in in Israel and, and Palestine, is very difficult to affect. Um, I want to ask you about your cancellation. Hmm. Um, at what the material and the practical things were. I, I've heard you say before that a cancellation happens in silence. What were the, the, the actual jobs that you lost because of sharing your views? Well, the, the, the first was a, a trip to Australia to teach writing comedy to uh, students. I had uh, like a tour set up in Perth uh, and Sydney um, and that was that was cancelled, and that was such a shock. That just came out of that was the first time, so it came out of it. it really rocked me. I, I couldn't. Was that two thousand and eighteen, Graham? Shortly after the initial tweet that sparked the huge, yeah, the huge um, right. Yeah. So it wasn't long after that, was it not? No, not long after that. And I didn't. And and the touring company didn't give me any indication that this was happening. You know, they did what they did what they they did they did what all these cor corporations do, which is they capitulated immediately. You know, they'd rather not have the headache, so they just they just they just do whatever activists tell them to do. Uh, but I thought in my in my naivety, I thought that couldn't happen to the Father Ted musical because I thought the Father Ted musical was such a juggernaut. It's obviously it would obviously be like printing money. So many people would see it. Uh, it was already written. All the songs were, you know, it was ready to go. Uh, and the unfortunate thing that happened was COVID because COVID put the brakes on it. And in that time that the brakes were on it, it allowed activists to just continue uh, trying to destroy my my reputation, you know. And finally, uh, you know, as, as I have in the book, uh, uh, Hattrick asked me to walk away. You know. But before they asked you to walk away, wasn't there, didn't Jimmy Mulville ask you to stay silent? Yes. Yes, he did. A few times. And so did Sonia Friedman. Of Son Sonia Friedman uh, who is the big produ West End producer uh, over here, who is the executive producer. And uh, it was just one of those things. It was like, it was like, 
you know, let's. I I, I want to be careful about using historical analogies because I always get into trouble. But let me just put it this way: if you see a great injustice that is hurting children and hurting women, how can you stop talking about it once you realize what's going on? How can you how can you ignore it? Um. But I, what I didn't kind of realize was that what to me was very clear and, you know, like trans rights activists, I mean, really trans rights activists are particularly vicious and evil, you know, uh, some of them turn out to be good people like like Richie uh, Heron uh, was a was a was a was a huge trans rights activist um, until he transitioned and then uh, detransitioned uh, and he very sweetly went around to all the people who he had helped you know whose careers he had affected and apologized to, you know because i think that like again you these people are swept up in a feeling that they are doing uh, great things you know um and that kind of carries over to all the people like arthur matthews jimmy mulville neil hannon who are only half paying attention because it's 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 too you know it's not something they uh, they were engaged with, and they just decided to believe the kind of um, the worst of me, you know, or at least they don't. It's not that they believe the worst of me. It's that they don't care enough about any of it to take a stand. Either they don't care about me, they don't care about the issue, they just don't care. You know, all they want to do is make money, and. Um, you know that that was it in the end yeah it just kind of died i felt that the um reading that section uh, and one of the overarching themes of the book is about moral dilemmas moral questions moral quandaries um and that was a pivotal moment you were being asked to pause not forever for a while mm -hmm as you're trying to move through and scale this project. And for any, for, as, as somebody, I was reading it thinking, my God, what would I do? My God, what would I do in this scenario? Um, but what, and it's, they do, what, what they don't realize is that, is that there's, even if you did want to get out, you can't really, you know? Even if you do want to kind of, because like I would, I, like, you know, as I, as I said in the book, I think there's been 75 plus hit pieces about me in the um, in Pink News, you know. Now, these wouldn't necessarily come off of things I'd said. These, you know, 75 pieces, what are they writing about? <laughs> you know, this is just stuff that they decide could, can be used to attack me. Um, so I knew that, like, like whatever I did, uh, I would never be allowed to forget that I took this side in the fight. So I thought, well, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe it was, and maybe it was the wrong decision in the sense that uh, tactically it was wrong, but uh, I just thought, well, no, it's it's like they're never gonna, they're ne there's no forgiveness in this. They're always gonna come at me. It's always gonna be a problem. And foolishly, I thought, well, once I explained the children are being hurt, I thought people like Arthur Matthews would come along, and and Jimmy, but. Again, just nothing seemed to affect them. How can you pause activism that's preventing children from being mutilated? How can you put a press pause on that? You know, and and I have heard from various people that you know it was it was my Twitter feed or my Substack that allowed them to get through to their kid to stop them from going down that road. If I did that once, even it would be worth 10 Father Ted musicals, you know? So even though I lost the musical, in the end, you know, what can you do? It, it is what it is. But I'm very disappointed by by my colleagues. They, they, all they had to do, all they had to do was say, of course women need fair sports. Of course children shouldn't be hurt in, in these clinics. You know, of course there's only two sexes. Like, and I can't get them to do it. I was I was thinking, you know, when people spend 20 years building up their career and you know what it's like, you've you've been you've scaled that mountain. Um, you've been nominated for God knows how many BAFTAs. You're at a very high status. I don't know if you've read um, Will Storrs' the status game. No, you should read this. Um, it's what what can happen sometimes is that the people who 
who are envious and don't achieve the kind of heights that you achieve, see an opportunity. Yes. There's a great opportunity here now. We can lift our own status by dragging down Graham's. Now, there, I'm not saying, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a theater and a form in which to have this trans debate. Um, and hopefully both sides can come together and discuss it in a reasonable and intelligent and thoughtful way. But I do think there were some pernicious actors, undoubtedly, not actors as in the profession, <laughs> actors, but you know what I mean, who saw, who would have seen an opportunity to take a high status white middle-aged man down yeah, but not just that. Um, but comedians, you know, two of the uh, two of the people who have been hounding me for the last few years are comedians. You know, there's a website cooked and bombed, which is full of uh, you know uh, angry, resentful comedians and comedy writers who basically uh, you know watch TV in order to slag off whatever they see. Uh, and and they just saw this as an opportunity, you know. They 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 were they they had years. I mean, Cooked and Bombed has been targeting me since the first series of uh, the IT crowd. That's like what two thousand and seven, something like that. Mm. I can't remember. Let me just see. Two thousand wasn't it? Two thousand after Black Books. Yeah, it was two thousand and six. Two thousand and six, yeah. right? So it's now twenty twenty three. So these are men in middle age who've been targeting me for over 20 years. And suddenly they have an, they have they have a kind of a language and a and a and a playbook to to draw from when they're, for instance, writing hundreds of letters to Hatrick. Brendan and is transphobic, he said this, he calls someone a groomer, all this sort of stuff. And they uh if you go to it might it's worth doing, have a look at the Cook the Bomb website and just write my name into the search engine, you know? Mm. They're just obsessed with me. And they're all kind of, you know, trail comedians. So it's, uh, yeah, it's dead. And also another aspect to this is that it is a kind of, we often call it a, a, a revenge of the mediocre, you know? This is, the, the, these are, you know, the, the people who generally tend to come after me you know, you never see any of their stuff, like, like the comedians, for instance, their stuff never goes viral. It never, it never, no one knows, knows, knows their material because they're just mediocre. And uh, this, there is a way that you can, and you see it with uh, J.K. Rowling as well, you know, the all these children's authors who suddenly decide she's evil. Well, why would they do that? You know, why would they want possibly the greatest competitor they have uh, pu push to one side, you know. I, I think that there's, there's, in J.K. Rowling's case, there, there's a status. Her immense status um, is is a, is a, a magnet for yes. the vulnerable, um, the the unsuccessful, those living in their you know that have difficult lives to go for, and the, and the, the vehicle through which they can attack is is Twitter. They can reach her, and if they can reach her, they can hurt her. Um, I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, um, are there moments in this campaign that you've been on that you you feel perhaps you waited, you went a little bit into the mockery and, and, and derision side, right? That you didn't keep it? Because I, I, I find that you may have antagonized inadvertently. Yeah, but the way I would, I, my answer to that would be... Uh look at the reaction that J.K. Rowling got. Mm. It's exactly the same, if not worse. It doesn't matter how I responded to it. I could have responded to it in the most polite way. My first tweet was incredibly, you know, it was couched in the way we always couch things when we got into this fight. But you've become disabused of that after a while, uh, where you're, compa you're like, of course, trans people need this, need that, you know. But, but then... The longer you go on, you realize that the other side is acting in completely bad, in complete bad faith, and that amongst the uh, amongst the people who do deserve sympathy and who do need to be protected, and I would include among among them young trans men, you know, young girls who are on testosterone, uh, uh, and anyone else who's been caught up, young boys as well, increasingly, who who feel that masculinity is toxic and want to escape from it. There's all sorts of reasons. 
and all sorts of vulnerable people uh, coming out of this fight. But there are also complete grifters, you know, people who are putting on a bit of lipstick, who are raising money and in, in begging for money for, for surgeries that will never happen, who are escaping extremely dodgy paths. So my derision and mockery was always aimed at the absolute worst actors in this, you know? And, you know, for instance, the one thing I got into trouble for was when I joined uh, the, the lesbian dating app, Her. Uh, I cocked my head, put on a simpering smile and wrote she, her in my bio and joined a lesbian dating app. Now I got into huge trouble and I was kind of re-canceled for that. And again, I have this kind of, this is a problem I have when I point at things and people look at my finger, you know, because men were doing this for real. Men are going onto these lesbian, lesbian dating apps are unusable for lesbians, practically, because there are so many men on them. And these men, they're not like transsexuals. They are men wearing makeup. Sometimes, sometimes they look like you or me, you know? And well, so... Well, what's the purpose there, Graham? Well, why would... I mean, are these straight white... Do you say straight men, are they? On the... Uh, 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 yes, they're straight men trying to meet lesbians. <laughs> it's, it's just insane. And, I, and and who knows why they do it? Uh, it? It's... They... Maybe some of them have been bamboozled as well by this and are and are wondering but some i i don't i don't understand i saw one guy just a young guy in his 20s maybe he's trolling who knows the point is that lesbians don't have a space of their own you know here's another here's another little little fact this is kind of uh this is this is this is a little sadder it's not not on the on the on the aspect of of really kind of um uh brutally malignant men but the, no, it is. It is about brutally malignant men. I'll give you another example of something that's happening. Grinder, the gay hookup app, that now has allowed trans men onto it. So these are young women on testosterone. They're joining the app. They're expecting gay men to be attracted to them as much as they are to actual men. And the gay men are not interested. What who, The people who are interested are predators who are straight who are coming onto the web to the website to meet these women so they're pretending to be gay and they are pred predating on these young confused women that's the kind of insanity that's happening because of this and that's the kind of man that's empowered by a philosophy that's so incoherent and confusing and homophobic and misogynistic you know that you're just going to get some of the worst people in the world taking advantage of it, you know? And my argument is that the people who go onto lesbian dating apps who are men, the people who predate on young women on gay dating apps, straight men who predate on young women in gay dating apps, they deserve mockery and derision. They're evil, some of them. And it needs to be called out in as many ways as possible. And I couldn't do it by just telling people it was happening. No one would, no one cares. No one seems to care. So again, so I joined it. And then of course, uh, I become the story, you know, when really the real story is that women are being, you know, that lesbians are losing their online spaces and their real spaces. You know, there's no lesbian bars in California, for instance. Can you imagine such a thing? If we thought that just after Stonewall and, and, and the sexual revolution, that in, you know, another half decade there'd be no lesbian bars <laughs> you know they would all accept men if they said they were women and that is the only uh um uh requirement for entry that you it's a self-selecting group of people who say i'm a woman and it depends on nothing except that declaration that's that's clearly wrong and clearly homophobic and clearly you know it's such a step backwards. So again, I didn't know how to draw attention to it, so I used comedy to do it because mm. that's my wheelhouse, you know. Um, just with the um, the projects that you lost, had had you considered writing under a nom de plume? Was there a way to like say? 
Like, yeah, like, you know what? It's it's interesting. Greg Lukianoff said um, in his book, The Counseling of the American Mind, that more, um, since 2002, more professors in the United States have canceled, have been canceled than during the entire period of Mac McCarthyism in the 1950s. Absolutely shocking. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I do think it's a historical moment, like like McCarthyism. Um, but but I like Donald Trumbo. You know the fa who famously wrote Spartacus and and uh, was uh, was able to kind of create a kind of factory for cancelled uh, uh, writers at that time. I don't know. It's not so much. To, it's the, that was Hollywood. Different different ethos. Different structure. Um, and and you know, it was kind of a. It wasn't like an emergency. You know, like the, the, I see what's happening to these young kids as an emergency. Uh, so can't like I can't put tools down. I can I can certainly put it on the back burner and 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 do what you might call passive activism, but I can't like down. Yeah, you've got to make a living, Graham. You know as well. Sure, sure. Uh, but it's hard. You know, I lost my agent recently. Uh, even if someone did want to hire me, it would be hard for them to to uh, find a way of doing so. Uh, so you know it's 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 tough, and also I know that the essential thing is basically I would have to form a relationship, and I'm not saying this is impossible; it just hasn't happened yet. But I would have to form a relationship with one specific person who did not tell anyone else that I was working on the show, because because in a group of let's say six people, there's going to be one person who thinks I'm a bigot at least, you know, so. It's just the different. tyranny of the minority, isn't it? Isn't that what isn't that what they call it? The tyranny where, where one person can influence the entire group. Um yeah, yeah. The werewolf. I I I, I did an interview recently on trigonometry talking about the party game werewolf, which is which is also a uh the the TV a, a show that people might traitors apparently is a show that follows the same principle. But mm. yeah, when when you know something that other people don't know, um it's very powerful. So you are working on a project. There is a pathway career-wise for you back from the cancellation, right? Just about, yeah. But who knows? This one might fall through. I don't know. I mean, I think I think if this falls through, I think the two things I'm going to concentrate on this year is uh, I'm going to do... I, I, I've kind of been enjoying doing stand-up. So, uh, you know, with the book... I can kind of combine the book and my stand up into a kind of a evening with Graham Linehan type of event that I think could do quite well. Uh, you know, so I'm going to concentrate on that in the short term, try and try and get, uh, you know, knowledge about the book out there because it's still the copies of it are still being hidden in bookshops and so on. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, after that, after that year, I'm, I'll see how I feel, you know, I'll see, I'll see if there's anything else I, I, that I really want to do, you know, I think, I think to be honest with you, I think the thing I'd most like to do is I'd like to write a play. I'd like to write a play that's a two-hander or a three-hander that can be done very cheaply. And I would like to just release it, you know, so that anyone who wants it can do it because uh, this is an issue that is equal, uh, just as important as, as what, um, you know, as 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 you say, you know, McCarthyism it needs its own the crucible. You know, we need to be able to talk about and understand what happened in the last five, six, ten, fifteen years, and uh, make sense of it, and and try and um, try and write write things again. You know, or I G H T. You know, but we need to be able to have conversations and arguments collectively without becoming vindictive and attempting to destroy each other's lives. I just wish that all sides could sit down and collect and, and gather together and just go through the ideas in a, in a grown up, constructive, thoughtful way without trying to destroy each other. My um, I, I don't like mobs. I don't like bullying and I don't like seeing people destroyed. Um, well, let me get like one of the very first pieces of activism I did in this was that I signed a letter written by a gay activist named Johnny Johnny Best, who it was a very sober, well written letter asking Stonewall to have a conversation 
And, and among other things, it asked Stonewall to try and help to reduce the toxicity around the conversation. Uh, Stonewall gave their answer within a day. They said no. Why, why, why would they say no, do you think? Because their, their philosophy uh, and their approach at the time was, was under the banner of no debate. And any time you tried to talk about it, they used the line, you're debating people's lives or you're debating trans people's rights to exist. So the debate would be framed ahead of time as an evil thing to even contemplate having. OK, so we this letter was written, sent to Stonewall. Stonewall said no. I contacted a few people, asked them to sign it, among them uh, James Dreyfus, who uh, is Scottish he, actor features in the book. Yeah, Scottish actor who you know, was part of a sitcom called Gimme, Gimme, Gimme that was quite groundbreaking uh, at the time, uh, was in a very well-loved role in The Thin Blue Line. You know, he was a he was a, a bit like me, you know, he's exactly my age. We, he was in my first sitcom. And, um, and uh, he signed the letter alongside me. And he has barely worked in six years, you know, for signing a letter asking for a more respectful debate. If you asked him, would he sign it again? What do you think he'd say? He's so sweet because I feel responsible, you know, for, for what happened to him. And uh, I once asked him uh, and I said something like, I, I, I helped re destroy your career. And <clears throat> he's like me. It's like, no, once you once you once you're doing it, once you realize what's going on, nothing's more important. Nothing's more important than saving the next generation of kids. Who, who might be sucked into this. Nothing's more important than, you know, stopping women from losing their livelihoods because they try to talk about this. For me, it's, it's, it's you know, I, 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 don't, I don't regret it in that sense. It's like, no, what else could I have done, you know? And, and I think James feels the same way. One of the things that I... Uh, I the, the, the American Psychiatric Association have said that... Um, one of the, the a sudden and catastrophic event can lead to people taking the ultimate decision to end things prematurely. Will Store, the writer of Status Game, has said that a, a sudden and catastrophic loss of status is one of those catastrophic events. And what I worry what I worry about when when looking at the debates on both sides is is the mental health effects that it, it's having on everybody who's engaged in it, right? You had a sudden and catastrophic loss of status and a material loss in terms of your, and you've spoken about being on anxiety medication, right? Like, what, I, why does it have to be such a mental health catastrophe for everybody on both, on all sides that's getting involved in it, you know? I would argue it's not a mental health catastrophe for the, for those on the other side. The other side are, having perfectly normal careers and completely untroubled by by the whole thing but on our side yeah it's uh you know it it affects your your work it affects your social relationships uh you know it's um yeah it's very distressing and uh and 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 you can genuinely see i i think jillian phillip who was a author who lost her career and is now driving a truck she said that the aim is to make you kill yourself. That's that's the, it's almost like an online game where the aim is to make you make you kill yourself. Uh, and, you know, it's like the best way you can say F you to them is by not doing it, you know. So whenever I'm in whenever I have my darkest moments, I just I just take great pleasure in in knowing that, you know, uh, I'll be I'll be visible fighting, you know. Um, I won't ever back down. I know I'm right. Uh, that keeps me going, you know. What has, uh, in terms of the support or the reaction from your the country of your birth, been like? Uh, well, non-existent really. I think that like. Obviously, there, there's a there's there's a, a a a big Irish resistance to this stuff, and I'm friendly with lots of people in that world. Um, but in general, you know, I don't really I don't really blame 
them in a way because like I do think that in the in the best of times when you're still even beloved by everybody the writers of sitcoms are not really they're completely invisible you know which is fine most of the time it was fine up till now you know um but I did think that considering the position Ted had in Irish society you know I've probably been more responsible for kind of sense of humor uh, in terms of memes and so on than, than than many other people i thought that the lingering affection would mean that people would pay a little bit more attention to what was happening to me and might stand up for me a little bit more um but no it was just again it's almost like even people i'd i'd worked with like i worked for instance with Carl mcgorman uh, of Amnesty uh, Ireland. He's no longer CEO, thank God, even though there's someone just as bad replacing him. But I worked with him on Repeal the Eighth, you know? And the video that my wife and I did, I think had a big effect on Repeal the Eighth, you know? Again, something I thought there might be a little bit of warmth and appreciation for. But no, it was, you know, it, it, it's 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 been... Again, the, the loss of status is complete. Is it, 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 I lost it in Ireland, lost it in the, in the UK. I don't think there's, um, you know, I don't even think people know about it for the most part, you know? And every time I do something, like for instance, I'll give you an example. I, I spoke to an Irish Times uh, reporter and he spoke to me for a full hour in which I explained all my positions and why I felt... The way I did. And several times during the conversation, he tried to talk about Enoch Burke. And I actually don't know the full story of Enoch Burke. I haven't been paying that much attention to it, um, possibly because I knew he had a uh, very religious background and and I didn't know whether, uh, I didn't know how much that had to do with what was going on and so on. But anyway, I hadn't really followed it. Um, and uh, And finally, he managed to get me to say something about it. And the headline of the Irish Times was something like, Graham Linehan says he and Enoch Burke are unlikely bedfellows, you know? So- And did you? Did I, did I say that? I can't remember how I, put, I, how I put it. I said something, yeah, eventually I did say something like, yeah, we're probably, we're probably um, uh, 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 agreed on things like um, pronoun use, even though he's religious and I'm not, you know? But the, my point is that three times he asked me about it and it was all to get that headline. The whole thing was to get that headline so they could further discredit me by uh, associating me with um, someone who's considered a religious zealot over there, you know? So you can't quite, the, the, you can't quite break through the meniscus of, 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 of what activists in the media have done. They've, they, they make it very, very hard to get your voice out there, to explain what's going on. I knew all the reviews in the Irish Times and so on. In fact, I know someone uh, offered to review it and was told, uh, no, we know how you feel, you know, because they thought it would be a positive review. So it's like, it's like you, you just can't break out of what, of the box that they've created for you, you know? That, 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 that like that is quite a serious um, assertion. If we think about, I mean, the Irish Times would be considered, should be considered a bastion of objectivity. Yeah. But it's, um, it's and the bad. literary supplement, like they've, they've got to be looking at these, the books that are rev reviewing them dispassionately. And, and um, so what you're saying is that essentially that the, a person who offered to review it, um, it was predetermined that it would be a positive review and, and the Irish Times would only review it if, if the review would be negative. Yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That, that's, yeah, I, um, yeah, that's very concerning. Um, but, you know, like we know, you, you just know what kind of review you're getting according to how captured the paper is. The Irish mm. Times is completely captured by gender ideology. The Guardian gave it a bad review, completely captured by gender ideology. Independent, completely captured uh, the argument breaks down with uh, uh, the Times because Janet Turner gave me a bad review, but that's for that was for personal reasons because she just doesn't like me. Um, and 
and yeah we you know the when it, when it goes outside these very uh, captured uh, papers we get we get the review you know we deserve which is it's it's a pretty good book you know but i, I it, it's a fantastic book and i but i think there's a huge opportunity here graham if the audience if 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 judici uh, thoughtful literary readers objective readers there's a huge opportunity to create newspapers and create media that are that are honorable and will stay objective and will consider both sides and are not audience captured you know yeah for, for, for creators to come along and 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 plant their flag on the ground and say we're going to talk to all sides in the argument and we're, we're going to maintain objectivity no matter what yeah absolutely but at the moment for instance in the uk the only the only channel doing that is gb news like gb news has persistently interviewed maya forstadter helen joyce me other people in the gender critical fight and gb news is considered just a a, a fascist channel by by uh, uh a lot of people um and yet the bbc it it has it it basically refuses to speak to these people. So even when when you do get a, an organization that's trying to break out of the bubble, you know they'll they'll find they'll use and what they do now to people like me and Maya is they call us right wing because we appear on GB News, you know. So so there's a whole framework set up that makes it very very difficult to be heard by a mainstream uh, audience. Um, but you know the way I, the way we're thinking of it now is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, like it, the awareness of the book is very low, but 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 as time goes on, you know, it'll be harder and harder to ignore. Well, one, the book is a tale of two halves, if you like. The first half of it is about your journey, how you broke into comedy writing, and I think it's very important to remind everybody who's listening to this conversation, who may be coming out of a film school, who may be looking to break into writing in Ireland, in the UK, in New York, in Dublin, that you chart that journey. And it's full of hints and tips about how to work with actors, the process of writing, how to engage with producers, how to find an agent. This litany of stuff. I came out of, uh, in 2014, out of the National Film School. I did a, a master's in, in uh, screenwriting. I could have used this book as a template and a guide on how to break into comedy writing in the UK, which can be transposed to the United States and to Ireland. So anybody that's watching this and is in film school, get the book for that reason and for, for many others, but 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 that is a, a very important reason. Yeah, is the, the this conversation is the reverse of the book in the sense that like the book is 75% about my career and about comedy and 25% about this issue uh so yeah it's uh i'm glad you i'm glad you think it's useful that's really that's really good to know you know but you know as they say the very first thing i was kind of like i had a plan my plan was i'm getting older my sense of humor is going to get a little bit creakier as i get older um so what i could do is uh is um uh teach you know start to start to try and teach a younger generation that's what i was thinking as well yeah, or yeah. You. And, you know, that was taken away from me, too, you know. Um, and in fact, recently, it was very funny. Uh, there were two comedy writers and a producer, you know, again, a very kind producer was trying to put me together with them to try and help them on a project. And they got back to me and they said that one of them was non-binary and he would be frightened of, of, of working with me. And I just thought a non-binary comedy writer, you know, you, you, you're going to have to give one of them up. You know, because, you know, the one part of one part of uh, comedy is really not taking yourself so seriously as to believe that you're a special new kind of human because you don't you don't feel you fit into any category, into sexual categories. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, I'm I'm still going to I'm still I'm actually thinking that is an, another aspect that I haven't yet exhausted. I think there's more to be said about comedy writing, about how to construct a script. Um how to how to know when to walk away from it, how to know when to uh, fully commit to an idea, all that sort of stuff is really fascinating to me. So if I can't teach it, I'll put it in a book or something. Yeah, I, I found it I found it absolutely fascinating to the, the pieces where you're in with Dylan Moore and you're in with your you're constructing scenes, you're developing scenes, you're getting it, getting it on its feet. 
um, for any theater director, any any filmmaker, anybody, it, it's really, really fascinating stuff. Um, so thank you for that part of it. Good luck in 2024, Graham. Thank you so much. Thank you.